your approach of what we've done in Almond and, and the recommendations. So I'll, I'll move quickly there, probably, uh, you know, 15 minutes or so on some considerations, and then Dr. Adescavich will have uh, his uh, presentation following that. So, Danny, we good? Ready to jump in? You went mute for a second, Danny. You still hear me? I muted myself. Yes, we're good to go. Okay, here we go. So when we're considering when we're considering this, um, you're considering this time at whole split. We have a lot of stresses going on. Abiotic stress. You hear us speak of that, and others others speak on that. Primarily, we're thinking about well, drought conditions, heat conditions, all those things can impact uh, the ability of the plant to finish uh, adequately adequately. Uh, produce photosynthates and respiration can be um, decreased. And that all drives to lack of carbohydrate storage for adequate yield in that return return season or return bloom and, and set. We've got a heavy crop this year, so uh, the considerations um, will be important how we handle that going into the next uh, you know month, two months. I'm gonna move my screen here to the side. So I, I put this slide up here. Those of you, I understand many of you will just be listening, so I'll try to do my best uh, play by play. Uh, I'll try to channel some Giants baseball, Dave Fleming or John Miller and try to get you uh, describe the slide as best I can, know that you may not be looking at the slide. But when we think about abiotic stress and we think about dealing with a stressful situation like we have a whole split in almonds, many things going on there. At Redox, we are really focused on how do we drive photosynthesis? That's that primary pathway. We're building carbohydrates, lipids, amino acids, and you see this, that circle continues. That all adds to our root stems, leaves, help finish the crop uh, and, and ready for next year. But at the same time, what's going on that we often forget about is that secondary metabolic pathway where these phytochemicals, antioxidants, uh, like terpenes, phenolics uh, in particular, they all aid in the plant's ability to deal with stress. These are both going on at the same time and the ability for the plant to have enough energy and resources to run this photo, that photosynthesis cycle as well at the same time not lag or stagger and its ability of that metabolic, secondary metabolic pathway is critical and DICAP plays a role there and I'll, I'll highlight that. So we think of potassium nutrient transport is critical. Uh, late season, uh, that water movement in and out of the vascular system, uh, the stomata regulation, uh, the influx and efflux of potassium right there helping with that CO2, oxygen, uh, uh, water, that, that exchange uh, there at the stomata is important. And uh, protein regulation, many things that potassium is critical for. Just a note here, we know that we have many available uh, different forms of potassium in the soil. You got your fixed, you got your exchangeable, and in solution. So that's constantly flowing back and forth. And, and uh, always is uh, important to potassium fertilization throughout the season, particularly late, because of the soils don't always give up potassium when we need it. And that's a critical point when we're coming into the most, uh, the most stress and heat that is, uh, that is on the, uh, the plant. I just got a text, Tracy Miller dropped off, Danny, if you can, you can help him on that. So I, I highlighted this on the left, uh, those of you that are, are watching or, or listening, we have our base saturation, our chemical extract of potassium, but also it's important to look at the soluble paste because often we might think we're in good position when it comes to percentage on the CEC of potassium, could be a five, six, 7%, but that does not always mean that you have adequate amount of potassium in solution. So it's important to, to look at your paste extract, look at your leaf analysis, and also you know, there's a lot of work being done in sap analysis as well as just getting in the field and looking to see how the, the crop is responding. Again, picture of your, uh, the stomates here and then the stomata regulation, potassium plays an important role there in that regulation and how, how well it's able to, through heat events uh, at night, during the day, how it's able to move, adequately adjust, depending on the environment. So plants and heat, couple things here. Uh, the transportation of water obviously is important. Potassium plays a role in there. The defense that the plant has against stress is what, I'm gonna do this. It's Growth is really slowed when, when the stomata closure is not optimal and a severe defense mechanism that the plant has, it'll shed leaves if it can't do that very well, you have that leaf drop. And then what is that doing to your nutrient allocation and your carbohydrate storage? What are those implications moving into next year? We've got a heavy crop uh, up and down the state for the most part. And so the tree is under enormous amount of demand 
And so really feeding that, taking care of that, particularly irrigation management, potassium management is critical for uh, next year's crop. Okay, so a bit about DICAP. Uh, DICAP is a 03150. We're talking about heat stress and plant nutrition. Uh, rates uh, in tree crops as a foliar, anywhere from a pound to three pounds uh, is our typical rates. If you're looking at that whole split application or post harvest harvest application, the two to three pound window is pretty typical for those, uh, those events. Uh, how does it work? It increases phenolic compound production. You deliver nutrition. There's amino acids, humic fulvic acid that's in the product, but also uh, proprietary carbon uh, compounds that drive this increased phenolic compound production that help battle the oxygen free radicals that slow that secondary metabolic activity. A couple things on bud development and almonds. I've got a few slides here that are just general slides. So that initiation, that bud development uh, for next year's crop is, is happening from whole split all the way to the post-harvest period. Uh, that's influenced by a variety of, of things, a variety of, of nuts, uh, the weather that year, your, your irrigation or your water management, and other practices and fertilization. Um, Carmel and Butte, this was research done by a lamp that the floor initiation occurred before whole split on those varieties. And I'm, I'm sure other varieties, as we look at them, you dig in, you'll see that as well. Nonpareil, that uh, floral initiation seems to occur after whole split. So we're managing multiple varieties in the field, something to consider in your, your treatment there is, is dealing with this uh, moving into next year and trying to build your carbohydrate storage. Uh, developing and maintaining spurs, you know, the grower practice is really um, the heavier the load on that spur, the light interception on that spur. We know that even with best light management, if you have a, a spur that is double, triple, you're going to have a hard time or a severe mortality of that spur coming into next year. Uh, that's David Dahl does quoted some work. You'll find that on, on his page there of, of that and, and the importance of potassium levels to reduce to, to reduce that spur mortality going into the next year. Um, just to note that almond flowers, they continue to, to undergo development, even through slightly even in dormancy, that's still happening. And uh, the vegetative buds, they differ in that way, that they have a rest period uh, and a maturation process is different than the uh, floral buds. Um, you know, they look different, vegetative more pointed, flower buds out there, they're plump and, and round as you're, as you're looking in the field. And, I, I have seen this and research has showed that, that post-harvest water stress definitely has a negative effect on that next year's fruitfulness. And uh, you'll see that in watching that period of dry down, that, that fine line. I know many of you are working with that and working to improve there so we don't stress too much, particularly potassium is robbed during that stress period. And that does hurt us going to the next year. And, it, and that will be a cumulative effect. So this, this bit about carbohydrate accumulation, it is a season long goal. Uh, but it is very critical at this whole split to post-harvest, that late summer, early fall period. Uh, retention of leaves will help that. Uh, it'll help build carbohydrates. You're just moving. Your photosynthates are, are building longer, so we want to hold those leaves where we can, and that energy is stored in the roots, branches, trunks, and the spurs uh, for that developing tree. Just a, a, a note on here, just a reminder, you know, over 96% carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, that carbohydrate. It's a small sliver of nutrients make up the rest, you know, less than 4%, but it's that carbon, hydrogen, oxygen that what we're going after. Zinc, you know, if you're, you're light on zinc, you're gonna have a poor nut set. You'll see that before you'll see the deficiency on the tree. Uh, it's involved in chlorophyll formation. Uh, and th it is very active there in that production of oxygen. And that's important for enlargement of leaves and stems uh, excuse me, uh, leaves and, and the stem elongation you can see early that next season. Uh, when it comes to boron, this is also considered an important micronutrient at this period. Uh, you get your pollen germination, your pollen tube formation, and just the viability of the pollen and activation itself. Uh, Post-harvest applications do help replenish those reserves and they will strengthen those developing buds. Some work that was done also, uh, David Dahl, uh, had did some work and, and I've read this that studies, multiple studies have shown that a foliar spray of boron can increase crop set the following year regardless of the boron hole content. So that yield bump is still observed even in sufficient uh, orchards that would come back after the whole analysis. That's interesting. It doesn't, boron seems to not mobilize very well from uh, dormancy into the spring. And so uh, having extra 
uh, boron late season seems to help in our yield uh, returns the following year. UC studies have also shown the nitrogen, particularly low by urea, has been very helpful in increasing yields in almonds. So why urea? Just a bit on this. You know, you got ammonia, uh, carbon dioxide, that form of nitrogen really helps with fruiting development and less on the vegetative side. So just, just a few notes on this, just where it's stored. You know, you're getting that following uh, post-harvest applications, you're getting that nitrogen up to 40% stored in those flowering spurs. There's obviously some in the shoot tips and bark as well, but, but double the amount there in those spurs. Um, even some cold, this was cherry work done, this, this cold data that I have there, but uh, you saw some cold acclimation when they were treated with urea uh, in the fall. They're more cold hardy going into uh, the spring compared to the untreated. So something to consider there. And again, we're just adequately, we wanna, we wanna provide carbon for that plant so we don't have an excess of nitrates stored in the vacuole. Uh, when we have that, we have weak vegetative growth that is easy for uh, pathogens to, to accelerate and, and take hold. And the other part, part thing is we're not storing carbohydrates in the form that we need. So adequate carbon and nutrition is critical in that, that time frame. So a couple, couple yield things we'll look at. This is a non pareil almond. When you consider those three, uh, boron, zinc, these are redox versions, triplex boron, triplex zinc, low by urea and dicap. You can see the rates there, two pounds, quarter pound boron, uh, three quarter pound zinc, and a five pound low by urea. What you saw in the return yields that following year, uh, substantial. Those of you who can't see the slide, you're, you're plus, plus 600 pounds um, in the uh, uh, increase, you know, five to 600 pounds, if you do that post-harvest treatment, whether you did not, or even a grower standard of your zinc sulfate, your soluble bore type materials is better than not doing it, uh, your, your MPK. Um, and a competitor program also provided good yield. Uh, the return on investment was very good. If I can go back a stage there, for every dollar you spend on the reduction product, there's a $43 return on investment. Uh, so, so money well, well spent there on that, that spray. Another one, what I like about this post-harvest application data is you look at this one. This was done by a... Uh, R&D team of a distributor uh, that we work with in California. They took a grower standard and they took die cap at two pounds. They took die cap two pounds, triplex zinc in one treatment. Treatment four was die cap, triplex zinc, and triplex boron. And treatment five was just triplex zinc and triplex boron. So what you, you have here is which one's doing the work here? I'm trying to tease this out in the study. And it's pretty interesting when you see this, you look at treatment four, that was the best performing over the grower standard. You know, you're gaining, um, just quick math there, you're you know, 300 pounds, uh, three to 350 pounds more. So what was that combination? That combination was die cap, triplex zinc, and triplex boron. When you just use die cap alone, it was worse than the grower standard, which you know makes sense. You're, these are zinc boron dependent. If you, the tr treatment three, if you had just die cap and zinc, uh, better, slightly better than the grower standard, which has zinc boron uh, MPK in it, uh, but quite not quite as good as the dicap zinc and boron combination. And then the last treatment was triplex zinc and triplex boron. No dicap here. Again, didn't perform uh, as well as the grower standard. So that combination, again, and our work that we've seen in the field and research work has been has been a good one. So. That, that grew a, a product that is similar to, to DICAP, has DICAP technology in it. The reason being is it's called Banks. The reason we developed this is to simplify the process. Instead of having those three products, we just put them in one, and it's called Banks. And so it's a three pound rate here. So you have an equivalent of two pounds of DICAP in here, and you've got that ratio of our triplex zinc and triplex boron all in one product. It's called Banks. It's a three pound rate, particularly at your post harvest or whole split. We find if, if customers have generally not gonna go in at post harvest, but they will do a whole split application, we recommend that they do this because you're getting a more, a full nutrition load. If you're gonna come back at post harvest, do your die cap at whole split and then banks at your post harvest applications. Analysis on that, on banks, it's a 20, 32, 1.5% boron and 6% zinc for those of you just listening in. Die cap is a 03150. Again, complex with amino acids, humic and fulvic. Same with banks. 
And I did mention a couple of products here, so I'll just quickly go through those. Triplex zinc is a 25% zinc. It has amino acid chelation and, and uh, it has a fulvic and, and humic acid as well. There is an organic version of that, if organic is, is your flavor and, and interest. I mentioned other micronutrients. There's a triplex micro product that we have. It's 2% boron, 2% copper, 6% iron, 6% manganese, some molybdenum to help drive that nitrogen metabolism in the plant, and 6% zinc. It's available in a flowable as well. And then there's an organic version of that triplex micro, same analysis, but just organic. And then lastly, triplex boron. It's a 16% boron material. Okay, and the last slide, just a reminder of those timings. Your whole split, it's a two to, our recommendation is two to three pounds, one to two applications during your whole split application. And if you're gonna come back at post-harvest, you can do a variety of things. Die cap at two pounds, you might have other zinc and boron that you like, or our triplex zinc, triplex boron, you see the rates there. Or the simplified version would be banks at three pounds, which have those technologies involved there. So that is our uh, recap of what we recommend and success we've seen over the years at this whole split and uh, post-harvest nutrition timing as a foliar approach. Okay, that's the end that I have. Uh, we'll hold uh, questions uh, for the very end. So. Danny, I'm going to end my slideshow. If you can pass it to Dr. Adescavage. Okay, I stopped sharing. So, again, Dr. Adescavage, uh, Department of Microbiology, is a professor there in plant pathology at the University of California, Riverside. He's on various, numerous boards, almond, uh, works with walnut and citrus industry, uh, apple, cherry as well. So we're pleased to have him and, and look to turn the time over to, to uh, Dr. Adescavage. You gotta unmute yourself. There we go. All right, you're good now. You're good now. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you very much, uh, Jared. I think we're uh, ready to get started here. Uh, great introduction. Uh, it really, uh, I think almond nutrition is uh, a critical factor for some of these almond diseases, especially what we're going to talk about today with uh, alm almond uh, hull rot. So uh, many of you know I work on all kinds of diseases, and uh, this timing, you know, when uh, Redox asked me to give a presentation. This is a really good time to review uh, whole rot and some of the uh, strategies available to manage this uh, rather complex summer disease. And so it sounds real simple, but uh, you know, there's always details in, in uh, getting through the, some of these uh, diseases. But uh, many of you have seen this slide before. We have uh, flower, foliar, fruit, even root and crown diseases of almond. Uh, you know, as we, the top row goes through like springtime diseases and then the bottom row is our uh, late spring and summer diseases that we commonly uh, deal with. We just got through the uh, April, May period where we're trying to manage scab and alternaria leaf spot sprays are going out. Rust, fortunately, some of the sprays that work for those diseases also work for rust. But we're just getting into this uh, whole rot uh, phase, which is obviously linked to the physiology of the, of the uh, host and the maturation of the uh, fruit or the almond uh, nuts themselves. And so whole rot is linked to uh, the splitting or whole split stage because that's an injury and some of the pathogens like that injury to get into the, um, into the fruit. So whole rot is uh, uh, one of the diseases that we are battling and it, we call it the good grower disease. And uh, one of the reason is, is that uh, it's hard to shut down a tree or slow down a tree 
Uh, and so we're trying to understand uh, the nutritional aspect as well as the microbial aspect and trying to inhibit the growth of the pathogens. But there's a big component is in the management, the irrigation management and the nutritional management of the tree. So just quickly, the disease triangle, many of you heard this many times before, but we, I remind people that this is still critical with most of these microbial diseases, which whole rot is caused by fungal pathogens and, and they, they need that interaction. The host has to be at a susceptible stage. It has to be going through hull split and that's when we get our, our senescence of the hull and a lot of these microorganisms like fungi can take advantage of a plant that's going through the senescence of maturation of that fruit and ultimately uh, dropping of the uh, almond nuts themselves. So temperature obviously and wetness are, are critical components of the environment. Uh, the host physiology, as I mentioned, uh, the splitting of the hulls, the cultivars and, you know, the cultivars that are vigorous growing and are difficult to slow down their growth. They have a long hull split period, uh, like nonpareil, for example, very, uh, there's a reason why it's planted 50% of the acreage in the state and uh, it's a very uh, high producer and uh, it's hard to shut down because it's constantly trying to grow. So we're trying to get through that whole rot, whole split period to prevent whole rot. And then, you know, you have to have the pathogen there, which is the presence of inoculum. So that triangle of the pathogen, the environment, and the host comes together at the whole split uh, phase of, of the season of the almond production. So what is uh, whole, whole rot? It's caused by uh, fungal pathogens. The major pathogens are rhizopus, stoanifer. This is a, a soil-borne uh, fungus that's ubiquitous in to many soils around the world, not just California. Uh, you can see as the hull splits, the fungus likes to get into there and it grows on that injury, then it grows down inside uh, following the moisture as that hull is splitting and separating from the, the shell. And uh, if you took a slide and made a slide of that black area, you'd see these round uh, spores. These are the spores of rhizopus stolonifer and there's black there's mycelium in there as well and so typically because california is very dry we don't usually see things on the outside and so you see this dark mycelial growth and spores along that uh, suture where it split and <clears throat> that's where uh, uh, as you see in this upper fruit here uh, the splitting is the injury and the spores being blown around are uh, eventually end up there and start to colonize uh, like a perfect environment. So that's, that's where the disease triangle. Here's a senescent uh, hull. Here's the moisture because it's splitting self-injury of the splitting of maturation and senescence of the hull. And then the, the spores come up. And so there's our pathogen. So we, this is all visualized right here on that uh, hull split stage. There's another pathogen that also causes hull rot and uh, typically uh, monolinea fructicola, our old brown rot friend. And it can also uh, land on the hulls if there's unusual rain in, uh, in June going into um, hull split. And we've had a few of those in the last five or six years where we get a rain in June. Well, the monolinea spores, as you see on the far right, they're also um, floating in the air from whatever bloom, blossom bite uh, type or green fruit rot that occurred in the orchard. And these spores continue to land on susceptible tissue like the hull of an almond. So those are the two major pathogens. Uh, but we also see in more recent times, there are other organisms colonizing these hulls. Uh, down south, um, Mohammed Yagmur down in Bakersfield is also seeing that aspergillus hull rot, which is uh, somewhat similar. It forms these dark spores in the bottom left of your screen. It has these dark blackish spores. It also forms between the 
the shell and the inside of the um, hull. And, uh, and you can compare and contrast to the rise, of course, on the right-hand side, upper right, where I, I just showed you this very similar, but it seems to be more like, it's not jet black. I call the aspergillus like a jet black with these little individual tufts of spores where the rhizobus just fills up black spores uh, all through that, um, between the hull and the, and the kernel. Um, if you get rain or you get high humidity, you could actually see rhizobus sporulating on the outer surface, which is highly unusual for California. And so the upper right images are what we typically see by far rhizobus in our surveys, rhizobus uh, hull rot is most common around the entire state, but there are locations where aspergillus can be more prominent or where monolinia can be more prominent where, uh, you know, maybe other stone fruits are being grown that might like peaches or apricots, which might influence uh, the inoculum levels next to the almond orchard. So uh, the historical management practices, I mean, what can you do? Well, there's varietal susceptibility. We know that nonpareil, some of the newer varieties, Monterey and Wood Colony also get a uh, whole rot. Less susceptible are, are the, some of the pollinators like Butte, Fritz, and Padre. But obviously you have to create these environments. And so what have we been doing in the last few years? We've been, over my, you know, the last few years, I qualify that. It's, uh, the last few years of my uh, uh, career maybe, but uh, obviously we've moved towards higher density planning. And so you, and that's kind of the opposite of what, we, what we're trying to do for managing. You, you wanna go to lower density to have more air circulation or you gotta make sure you're hedging to get airflow through the orchard, planting the orchard north, south or with the prevailing winds, all allow for greater air uh, circulation. They say that you don't need to prune almonds that much, but still, uh, as you're in high density situations, you have to maybe do hedging to increase air movement, reduce humidity. These are all uh, ways, the cultural practices that can reduce the, uh, that disease triangle from the environmental approach. Irrigation management, it started, uh, it was well recognized that if they, that if we change the irrigation practices, you can again change that environment. If you stress the tree too much, as Jared was talking about though, you, you get less buds forming and, uh, and, and for next year's crop. So some people have figured this out. And so they came up with a regulated deficit irrigation that's not as severe as the original uh, deficit irrigation plans. But obviously growers have made that connection and researchers know too that that uh, if you cut the water off too much, you're gonna be affecting bud differentiation. As Jared pointed out again, that's basically, we say from June to through August, there's next year's buds or flower buds are forming. And so if you stress the tree too much, you're likely to have less flowers the following year. Uh, clean cultivation, uh, again, you know, the more humidity you have in that, uh, on the ground orchard floor cover, uh, you know, you have a lot of plants there, you're gonna get humidity. Uh, you can get some uh, increase of that favorable environment. So uh, clean cultivation, keeping the weeds down, keeping it uh, ready for harvest, is a good idea. Um, but the, if you go to the last bullet here, the dust control, we don't want dust. Obviously, that's where the, the pathogen rhizopus is in the soil, and, and they produce those black spores, which are full of uh, uh, melanin, which is a black pigment, which absorbs sunlight and protects that spores. So those spores can live uh, on the surface of a hull uh, for some time, and even when exposed to sunlight, because they're protected. And so, you know, if you create a lot of dust in May and June, especially June, those spores, that dust, where does it all end up? It ends up on the leaves and on the, on the hulls. And uh, basically that's an inoculation method. So we, we strongly promote chemical uh, mowing, uh, using herbicides to uh, manage the orchard floor, especially going into the uh, hull split season. So that month prior, uh, dust control is real critical. The other thing is this nitrogen fertilization. Uh, obviously, 
uh, that's a, a key component to getting yields up really high. And we, we know that we recognize nitrogen is, is a critical uh, component to production of almonds. But at the same time, putting on lots of nitrogen going into hull split in June uh, or late May is, is something that is contrary to uh, managing the disease. So uh, most of these micro organisms, including fungi like rhizobus and monolinia and aspergillus, uh, they're after nitrogen too in order to grow. And that's one of the limiting factors uh, in, in many places, um, micro environment, so to speak. So uh, you have to do your nitrogen, but we're just saying uh, that you have to be careful when you apply that. And going into hull split is in June, the month of June is really not the time to be applying this. And I even went off to say, use the word cut off, but uh, that was a, that's maybe a strong term, but uh, sometime in the middle of May is when you really wanna slow down your nitrogen applications and then you can pick up again in the fall uh, with other fertilization programs as, as uh, Jared was talking about. So what we uh, do is we, uh, I've investigated a lot of fungicides over the years. Uh, many of you are familiar with these UC ANR uh, site that has this efficacy and timing of fungicide document. And uh, we, Samus and myself, up, update this uh, document. So that's a lot of the information about fungicides is located. Uh, you see in my circle chart, and so many of these fungicides over the years have been uh, registered. The key thing is that many of these don't have uh, activity against rhizobus. Some have activity against monolinea, and others have activity against aspergillus. So uh, <clears throat> the big thing that we're trying to say is not each one of these different circles with a number on them, these are FRAC codes and these numbers represent different modes of action, these different groups. So all of the products within a circle have the same mode of action. And so if we recommend uh, a DMI fungicide uh, for use against hull rot, uh, there's still quite a bit of choices of materials available within that, that group three that can be, uh, can be used. So <clears throat> again, uh, the DMIs, and then with the introduction of QOIs uh, in the 1990s, uh, also in the early 2000s, we got a lot of the DMIs. We identified these materials as effective against rhizopus, and then we set forth looking for other materials as well. And that's a lot of information, I realize that, but this is uh, well documented in that uh, uh, publication at the IPM. Uh, website for efficacy of fungicides. So we're gonna be focusing on group three, group 11, group seven, these groups here, as well as the pre-mixtures of uh, products that are uh, initially registered for um, hull rot. So one of the first questions we wanted to do was the timing, and this is with fungicides. It gives us an idea when when the uh, holes are getting infected. Uh, we saw that there was two major pathogens in this one location that we were working in in Modesto. This is uh, hole rot caused by monolinea fructicola and hole rot caused by rhizopus stolonifer. And we saw that uh, one of the better treatments was here early June for the monolinea pathogen. But when we went into looking at uh, Rhizobus hull rot, you see the early sprays didn't do as well as these later sprays where we felt that this was the critical timing at early hull split and maybe mid hull split in getting uh, the best results for uh, rhizobus hull rot control. We followed up these studies with um, um, other studies with uh, timings of 6.5 and 6.18 for brown rot. Uh, and then the 717 for rhizopus. Again, we were working in the Modesto area where there was lots of stone fruit in addition to almond production. We're getting here between 15 and 20% uh, uh, hull rot and uh, some of the fungicides we identified. And again, fungicides were never recommended up until we had these materials that had either the, th the three 
the frac group three or the frac group seven or the frac group 11. And so you're seeing some of the original work here to identify fungicides that would work uh, against whole rot. Here we have quash with PhD. This is a three and a frac group 19. And we are getting excellent results uh, for whole rot. And again, in a, mo in a location where monolinea was mainly involved. In another study, we did it with uh, non-parel for uh, whole rot as well, looking at an uh, early spray and then uh, focusing on the, on, uh, the rhizopus pathogen, doing two different timings. And again, these later sprays, we are hitting here, let's say with PhD, uh, getting that later spray with the uh, hull split stage, getting better results. There was a trend there. Although these were significantly all the same, our timings, we felt that uh, the later sprays were, were the critical ones for giving us our disease control. So uh, this brings us up to more recent times here. Um, uh, in 17, we tested a lot of different fungicides. These are some numbered compounds that are currently registered as fungicide products like Fervent, for example. UC1 is now Sevia. And you can see that with our two spray timing uh, for brown rot and whole rot, we're getting excellent uh, disease control. Again, under lower disease pressure, there's only about 10% here, uh, but uh, some of these fungicides were working really well on that uh, application strategy. Now, many of these fungicides that we identified, the DMIs, uh, we see real, this, what, these are individual uh, examples of the sensitivity of rhizopus to uh, these different fungicides. So the fungicides here are different concentrations and then these are the different isolates going across the bottom. So you see we have uh, uh, 50, 60 isolates here being tested and uh, we're comparing uh, the, the range of sensitivity and uh, for the most part it's very narrow for the DMIs, a little bit broader for the group sevens and the group 11s are still pretty narrow with uh, uh, some variation. But again, this gives us our baseline for monitoring resistance. And we're always worried about resistance overusing any of these products. So the good news is we've identified at least three groups, uh, group seven, group 11, and group three here in the lower left that are all showing some activity for managing whole rot. And those are our, our mainstay for uh, evaluating these uh, evaluating these fungicides, but also for managing whole rot in the field. So in summary, then we have good activity with the DMIs. They're rated as the highest. SDHIs uh, have some activity, but uh, there is some more range. We're kind of concerned about the range of sensitivity. The QOI is very active. And uh, the, again, the polyox in the group 19 also showed moderate activity, but uh, no reduced sensitivity. So in our uh, efficacy timing chart, you can see the fungicides are wrapped up in putting them on in June and July, and that's for the monolinea and the uh, rhizopus whole rot. And you see we're focusing on the frac groups 3, 7, 11, and 19, and mixtures thereof of those uh, materials. So uh, in summary of the fungicides, we have very really good uh, fungicides now. They're being recommended for uh, disease management for whole rot. We like the early hull split for rhizobus rot and it's perfectly timed with your uh, navel orange worm sprays. Um, well, Bentley and I worked on a lot of the timings for not only navel orange worm, but for the fungicides. And so we agreed on that early whole split stage as a critical uh, time. Uh, we're really seeing one to two applications being very effective. And again, the three, seven, nine, eleven 11 materials and 19 in various mixtures or singly in rotation would be the most effective. But, you know, we don't want growers just to be overly uh, reliant on fungicides. So we wanted to have remind people of all the other aspects of nitrogen fertilization, water management. That led us really to looking at other alternative foliar treatments besides fungicides to help manage this uh, 
disease. And uh, one of the big thing with patho the pathogen is, uh, has been explained uh, in other types of studies is that uh, they produce both uh, monolinea and rhizopus and even aspergillus produce this fumaric acid. And that's one of the main ways of killing host tissue and then growing on it. So these pathogens are known as nicotrophs. They like to grow on dead tissue. So how do they kill the tissue? Well, they have toxins or they have materials like fumar fumaric acid, which are produced. And when you produce in high concentrations in that zone, it will cause plant cell death. And so we were wondering if we could use alternative material to neutralize that acid. Well, back in 2015, that's only five years ago, we started looking, I was working with uh, Mid Valley and uh, that group, and uh, not to mention any names, but uh, they recommended it to me, they said, we'll try some of these, uh, what we called alkaline fertilizers and uh, or basic fertilizers. And we were trying double OK and dipotassium phosphate, which was the dicap. And uh, we were comparing it to various fungicides and we were doing different rates and different combinations with other uh, fungicides. But lo and behold, we were really surprised uh, that we didn't think it was going to work that well, but it worked just as well as many of the fungicides. And so dipotassium phosphate here had no phytotoxicity and we were using it at the two pound or 48 ounce rates in uh, our studies. And uh, with a single asterisk here is where we saw some phyto with the double OK but we didn't see any phyto with the uh, dipotassium. And so uh, with these sprays that have the two asterisks, we use 32 uh, fluid ounces or uh, in the, uh, two to 32 ounces in the first application and 48 ounces in the second application. And again, we were just exploring uh, different rates. So this is a two pound versus three pound uh, timing for the dipotassium. And this one was mixed with uh, Quadra's top and uh, uh, again, all the treatments basically came out the same, but uh, there was some nice activity that really caught us by surprise because it, it, these are non-fungicidal uh, compounds. So that gave us more emphasis to look at these uh, other fertilizers more carefully. Uh, Follow-up studies, we went to 48 ounces um, uh, on this Monterey. This is a later harvested variety. So the timing shifted. That's a good take home message. When we saw early hole split was in August for Monterey. For nonpareil, it's early July usually. Uh, and so you might have to put these sprays on differentially based on the physiological stage of each cultivar in your orchard. But the 48 ounce, it was uh, very, again, in 2016, we uh, saw a very good response, a great reduction, really high levels of disease. We're getting, you see here, there's uh, strikes per tree. When you start seeing 80 to 100 strikes per tree, something's, you know, very dramatically uh, favorable for the, for those pathogens to attack the, the tree. And uh, again, with the dipotassium phosphate, uh, very similar to some of the fungicides, reducing this down to between 20 and 40%. Um, excellent results for the, under that kind of disease pressure. And again, functioning very similar to, um, to some of the fungicides that we, that we evaluated. Here's some timing studies that we did. Again, we, were, we just call these things alkaline fertilizers, but uh, there's obviously more to them than just alkalinity. There's, it's gonna be nutritional balance uh, related to nitrogen uh, utilization. And as Jared said, we, you know, that there's a difference in storage nitrogen and, and nitrogen being utilized into producing proteins and amino acids. And so um, we call them alkaline fertilizers, but that was our perspective to, to neutralize the fumaric acid. But obviously they have other, other factors are going on when you put on these fertilizers that have a whole cascade of effects. Um, <clears throat> again, the two spray program, uh, this was on Monparel up in Calusa County, uh, the early hull split followed up by a mid hull split uh, application at 48 ounces and excellent results reducing from 20 strikes per tree down to about four strikes per tree, which in our minds was uh, very exciting. 
Uh, we also compared it with mixing it with some uh, other neutralizing things like lime, calcium hydroxide. Uh, that really didn't change it. The, the dipotassium looked fine on its own. And then we compared it to Sinetis, which is also a fertilizer. And, uh, but it's a seaweed extract and there's other things inside these extracts of natural products that uh, we saw some uh, effects there as when reducing the overall uh, level of whole rot, very similar to our uh, fungicide programs. And again, uh, some of these things would, would, when we were comparing them, Frontelis is a group seven and a 19, a seven and 11, seven and a three. And you, can, you get the idea of what we're doing here with a single application and we're getting uh, uh, good control with some of the uh, fertilizer uh, applications. Uh, in 2019, that's just last last year, uh, we added uh, Utilize with Ancinetis, different timings here, oh, uh, two weeks apart, uh, 7, 3, 7, 10, 7, 3, 7, 10. Uh, that would be, well, it's a week apart. Uh, we had different timings. We did the Sinetis a little bit later and then came back uh, here with a, with PhD as another treatment, uh, Sinetis in group 19. Uh, <clears throat> that was in a rotational program and uh, we saw some nice reduction. Here's dipotassium by itself, followed by these um, dipotassium and Sinetis, trying a mixture and then doing aluminum sulfate hydrate. That was a, a dehydration type uh, idea that we had uh, and that really didn't work that well. You can see it significantly hampered the dipotassium phosphate. So we're not really, we're, we're doing this stuff as experimental things, trying to see what is gonna have the greatest effect on reducing whole rot. And so uh, the dipotassium seems to be doing fine by itself. The Sinetis seems to be not really helping the dipotassium, but it is doing something to help, maybe to do something to the physiology and the nitrogen metabolism of, of uh, in, within the tree. So again, the fungicides, we, we talked about them. Uh, we have the alkaline fertilizers, and then we have these natural products, which are, from what I understand, uh, seaweed extracts. So these might be affecting uh, the enzymes involved in the, in the plant, like nitrate reductase, and uh, that might be helping to take stored nitrogen and keeping it in a, a form that's going to be metabolized into amino acids and proteins and not readily available to the microorganisms. So then the last thing I'm gonna talk about is we've also looked at uh, how to reduce inoculum reduction using foliar or soil treatments. Um, we're comparing in, in this stuff trials, we were looking at some biocontrol agents like Serenade. Here we did soil applications to the surface uh, in the ground. This is again, uh, well-managed orchards where they were weed control was very good. There was bare soil. We applied Serenade. Many of you know this is a, um, a bacillus uh, product that uh, was uh, formulated from fermentation. And uh, we tried this formulation, applied it to the soil in, in hopes of reducing the overall inoculum levels. And our main effect here is what we had a split, what we call a split plot. Uh, we did the nothing versus the serenade and all these treatments got treated here and then they got treated over here, all replicated in blocks. And so overall, when we add up all these numbers and add up all these numbers, we saw there is a slight reduction of about uh, significantly here of about 7% versus 10% overall for the serenade for all these treatments versus all of these treatments where there was no serenade applied. Again, we looked at uh, the different fungicides in that trial and again, we saw that they all behave, behave very similarly with a single application. And again, we were trying not to do the two applications because we wanted to see if there was benefits. And again, we kind of uh, set up the experiment to see if there was a, a effect here with serenade. So there is a slight benefit there. 
I'm going to wrap it up here uh, with this slide here. We tried other things like putting a quadris top and a bound on the soil surface, again, trying to reduce inoculum levels. Here in combination with the dipotassium as a foliar spray, this was a ground soil application. You know, again, we're getting very good, um, significant reductions. Um, even without these uh, inoculum reduction, the, the dipotassium and dipotassium in rotation with the Sinetis and the dipotassium, very excellent results, even without the uh, serenade or the quadrus top on the ground. So right now, uh, we know that's a, a, a tall order to try to reduce inoculum, but uh, we tried it. Uh, our focus in this coming year is gonna be on these foliar treatments, especially the um, materials like dipotassium phosphate, the uh, Sinetis, and uh, uh, comparing those to some of these other uh, fungicides uh, by themselves. So we could wrap it up uh, here. I, I already showed you this slide, uh, showing you that there are, we still have to practice uh, integrated management. And we covered the, all these points of irrigation, nitrogen, dust control, clean cultivation, all to, in the hopes of reducing this disease triangle uh, to less favorable for disease. Um, we can summarize the fungicides that we do have some good fungicides available. Uh, right now we call them alkalizing treatments, but I think they're more than that. Uh, the dipotassium phosphate seems to be uh, helping in many different ways. Maybe it's neutralizing fumaric acid and it's also stimulating uh, nitrogen metabolism. And so we're excited about that. Um, and we're gonna be looking at these new uh, materials as well, like Sinetis and Utilize. So the soil treatments didn't really come out as well as we wanted. It worked in some places and worked in others. Um, you know, there are differences in localities and so uh, between the soil types and, and so forth. So that's a issue that we're gonna have to deal with. We're not really that high on right now for growers, but we're looking into it as a research aspect. The bottom line is, is if you want good, good integrated uh, management of uh, whole rot, I think we have to focus on water management, orchard humidity and air movement, nitrogen fertilization, dust control. We have some fungicides that we can put on, but we also need to look at these uh, fung fertilizer treatments uh, seriously to help in balancing the nitrogen levels and helping with the uh, host response to potential infections by these uh, fungal pathogens. I'm gonna stop there and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I know I gave you a lot of information, uh, but uh, again, we're, 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 we're learning too and we're discovering uh, new things about almonds and whole rot. And we're excited to work with uh, Redox on um, looking at uh, fertilizer and nutritional levels for disease control. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Am I good? Danny, you hear me? Make sure everybody hears yep, you're me. You're good. Yeah, I had a couple questions, uh, Dr. Oscavich. Which one in, in your research has been more difficult? Which form of whole rot has been more difficult uh, the monolinea, rhizopus, what's your opinion there? Well, by far, I, I did mention that, but by far rhizopus stolonifer is statewide. In every orchard we go, we, even for when we find a little bit, we find some aspergillus, but whole rot is caused by rhizopus is the predominant one. Mm -hmm. uh, monolinea, again, you know, there's a lot of uh, stone fruit going out, almonds going in, you know, so it's hard to find uh, stone fruit orchards right next to, to uh, almond orchards. It's, it's seriously, it's seriously uh, decreasing. So uh, in my surveys, we've surveyed uh, eight, 10 orchards, each, each different orchards in the last two years. Um, Rhizobus is still one of the critical pathogens, I think, for whole rot, Rhizobus stolonifer. Thank you. If you have some questions, now's the time you can use your chat feature and uh, and send those up, and we'll uh, we'll take those as as we can. 
I have a question for you on your soil applied, the ground uh, soil applied to, as you were trying to knock down inoculum, was that uh, uh, 90, you know, trying to get 90% orchard floor coverage or was that sprayed on the berm? What, how did that go out? That went out as a, a, a full boom spray um, on, the, on the bare orchard. We had uh, the boom weed sprayer uh, boom set up to drive up the orchard and was hitting even the middles, uh, not just the berms. And so yeah. it was uh, basically trunk to trunk uh, yeah. on either side of the, of the row. And uh, we were trying to get complete ground coverage with these, um, whether it was uh, the fertilizers, I mean, excuse me, the serenade or the fungicides, uh, quadris top and the bound. Those were trying to be applied as a inoculum reduction from uh, trunk to trunk, so to speak, of the middles of the whole entire row. But again, there's a lot of variation there. And those, those three, the ones I showed you were different locations. And uh, the soil types can have a dramatic effect in inoculum levels there. So it's not as consistent as we wanted it to be. And I did that study again last year. And uh, again, there's a lot of variability. So um, we're not really coming out strong in recommending that for uh, growers. Mm -hmm. uh, as you saw in many of those slides, these fertilizers that we're testing, like your product, DICAP, seem to be very consistent in their performance. And that's one of our strong places. That's what we look for. You know, we have to, have to give growers guidelines on, mm -hmm. you know, what we feel based on our experience in these times of tests, what's going to give me the most consistent and give us good um, efficacy for in bang for your buck for the growers. And so uh, the die cap and some of these fungicides that I mentioned, uh, they seem to be the, uh, most consistent treatments for whole rot in combination with nitrogen management yeah. uh, for, and water management and, and so forth, uh, dust control and those types of uh, cultural practices. Perfect. Uh, another question got here, the, what shoot die back, which any, uh, any comments there? Um, is there one that causes more than the other or any, any work that you would share with us on that? Die yeah, back the, shoot, the shoot die back. Um, you know, we saw injury with some of these things like these uh, other phosphate products that we were testing. Um, I'm not bad mouthing those things. We were testing them at high rates, you know, a, a th two to three pounds to us is a high rate as a foliar treatment. Uh, so we were getting injury with those. Um, we haven't seen die back at all with, um, you know, any of these treatments, but what the what I think this question is leading to is that, you know, if rhizopus gets in, it starts to colonize those hulls, but then it starts to produce such abundant fumaric acid it, that fumaric acid is water diffusible, and it works its way upstream from the transpiration flow of water, which is going from the roots up to the tips of the shoots. And but uh, when you're killing a, a tissue these acids that are being produced are, are working their way against that water flow into the um, stem tissue and causing dieback. And so some, some situations, some uh, path, you know, not all these rhizopus are identical. They mm -hmm. might have greater uh, fumaric acid production. Mm -hmm. They'll actually um, cause greater dieback in some locations than others. So the, the, the goal is to keep the rhizopus from getting into and colonizing those holes. The more holes that are colonized, if you have one, think of it this way, if you have one hole colonized on a branch versus five or 10, there's just think of the exponential amount of fumaric acid entering into that shoot. And so then you get greater dieback. So the goal is to try to keep those, uh, whole split infections, especially by rhizopus, because that's the predominant one, to a minimum, you know, that you don't get abundant attacks that will then cause the whole shoot. And we've seen even one inch shoots dying back, you know, and the problem is that a lot of these, we had a disease, there's a disease complex known as lower limb dieback. And um, we think that rhizopus is a, a direct component of that. We're not saying it's 
all of it, but it has a lingering effect. And we call that a polyetic effect, meaning that it's going to not what you see here is going to affect next year because those acids that are produced still diffuse into that branch and we get uh, con con continuing death, continued death over the uh, from say it happens in August, you see the initial die spurs dying and some smaller branches dying. But if you have say five or 10 of those on a single branch, that's maybe a one inch or two inch branch, a scaffold branch. Well, next year that branch won't come back as healthy as a non-infected branch. And so then that branch gets really weakened and it gets susceptible to other pathogens and eventually dies. And so if you, if you have an orchard that has poor whole rot management, you'll see all these lower limbs dying in those, uh, lower canopy where the humidity is the highest, the um, light, you know, there's not good uh, light penetration. So things stay wet a long time. And so that's where we see the whole rot dieback. And uh, the goal is to prevent that uh, holes from getting infected. We never want to see, you know, the 90, 80 whole st strikes per tree. Uh, that means there's multiple infections on each scaffold branch and uh, that's gonna lead to more and more dieback. So if we can get things down, even 50 to 75%, we're gonna have a lot less branch dieback because there's a lot less acids going into the main uh, branches, which keeps those branches uh, from producing next year. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. no, that's, we, that's good. We got a question from Derek here. It says, um, if Pagar was to was going to do two whole split sprays 10 to 14 days apart and planning to use a fungicide and die cap. How would you advise positioning those fungicide in the first spray and die cap in the follow up? What are your thoughts? Well, again, uh, based on what we were just talking about, I think if you're in areas where there's not much stone fruit production, you're primarily dealing with rhizobus. Um, so my comments are focusing on rhizobus stone if we're whole rock. And so, if we are thinking about that situation, I think that the, the die cap has got to go on initially. And then you can, if you're trying to do a rotation program, uh, you can put a fungicide on, or if you had some, you know, everybody's different, you know, they sometimes they have severe whole rot. Well, obviously we've mixed die cap with fungicides. And if you had a severe problem last year and you want to get this under control, you don't want to see the die back next year and you want to, prune some of that stuff out that died and then you want to get on this thing at the whole split stage so that you don't have that the following year. Yeah, I mean, a lot of things go into these decision-making processes, but uh, a rotation of die cap with a fun, followed by a fungicide makes sense. Or if you, if you have a lot of disease and you really want to, you're in a location that you got hit hard by that disease whole rot, I would think you could do a mixture of die cap with a, a fungicide at uh, the beginning of whole split followed up two weeks later in mid whole split stage. So you can do, if you're not so bad off, you could do a rotation. And if you're really bad off, I probably would do a, a, a tank mixture. Of both. I would say what I see, I would say in the field, I see probably more combinations um, and probably, probably where they've had a history, of, like you're saying, where they, they will do a combination treatment, but it's a great question. Yeah, I, but I think these treatments are showing such consistency. And I mean, you see our multiple years of work. I think that uh, if, if you have a bit bad problem, that's one way to approach it. And so we want to see fungicide rotation. So you can do the die cap twice and then uh, you can do a, one fungicide, say a group three, and then you can switch to a group 11 and you're, you're practicing resistance management with the fungicides and you're using uh, fertilizer like DICAP as a, as a way of balancing your nitrogen management issues uh, as well as your whatever else is doing with you know, these uh, fumaric acids that are present in the, in the disease tissue. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions that anybody might have? Get them typed in here, otherwise we'll wrap this up. I think that's great. We've gone, uh, we've hit our hour mark. Yeah, 
I think that's that's great. So uh, thank you everyone for attending. Dr. Ascavish, thank you. Dr. Klitich, thank you. Uh, appreciate the information shared and uh, time everybody and uh, have a good afternoon. Anything you know how to get a hold of us and thanks again. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.